Did Splatoon 2 really come out nearly a year ago? I reviewed it soon after release, and being a fan of the first game, I had a blast with it. It was even one of my favorite games to release last year. Splatoon is just so much damn fun. But hey, I was still high on the Switch hype train. My opinion had to have changed by now, right? And you'd be correct. I love this game even more now than I did last year. Number 7 on my top 10 favorite games of 2017. Pfft, now it would be like 4. Speaking of that video, I was wrong. I do like Persona 5 more than Xenoblade 2. But enough of my dumb ass and my changing opinions. I've changed quite a bit in the last year or so, and so has Splatoon 2. There's been plenty of new content over the past year, including a new DLC campaign that's just released. And by just, I mean I'm finishing this script like 3 days after it came out. Leave me alone, these videos are time consuming. A new single player campaign in the form of paid DLC wasn't something that I was expecting. I'm not surprised by it, I just didn't think they would actually do any paid DLC for Splatoon. They seem pretty keen on keeping all new content free. And I totally didn't pre-order it like a month in advance, that'd be ridiculous. After we Smash Bros. announced, we all lost our goddamn minds in a glorious fireball of hype and- Wait, I'm supposed to be talking about Splatoon right now. Well, I'm sure it'll come out in August, which goes along with the theme of 8. Oh my god, it's coming out tomorrow, holy fuck! Right after the Splatoon tournament they were having during E3, they just casually mentioned that Octo Expansion was coming out the next day. It didn't release until like 11 at night where I live, though. But first opportunity I got, I freaking marathon this DLC. I finished it in like two sittings. Alright, let's super jump right into this new Octo Expansion. Once you've bowed down to a capitalist overlords over Nintendo and paid them 20 big ones, Head over to the subway in Ankopolis Square. Pale summer moonlight shimmers on the sea floor. An octopus, unaware of the dawn will bring capture, rests within a trap, dreaming fleeting dreams. Oh my god, this is a game about war hungry sentient sea creatures. What's up with this ominous poetry? In Octo Expansion, for the first time ever, you play as an Octoling as opposed to an Inkling. Who cares? I care, Kevin. I've been waiting three goddamn years for this feature and it feels so amazing! Ahem. <laughs> Anyway, you were fighting Agent 3, the protagonist of the first game, off screen, and you wake up in front of Captain Cuttlefish with no memory of who you are. This would be annoying like the amnesia trope usually is, but the game just kind of forgets that you have amnesia. They never allude to your past or anything, you just happen to have amnesia for some reason. After fighting with Agent 3, you both get attacked by something, and you and Captain Cuttlefish end up underground with Agent 3 nowhere to be found. Wander around a bit, find a metro station, talk to this ominous talking phone, and her task was finding the full fangs to make it to the promised land. Whatever the hell that means. Also, the protagonist is called Agent 8 now. What happened to Agents 5, 6, and 7? Overall, the story is still pretty self-explanatory. It's implied that this takes place during the main story, since Marie mentions that Cuttlefish and Agent 3 were busy doing something else. Otherwise, this expansion doesn't really care about when it takes place. Once you gain access to the underground map, you're shown how to move from mission to mission, and Cuttlefish pulls a walkie-talkie out of his ass, and you can get him to talk to Pooh and Molina from now on. But this is about what I was expecting. Splatoon's always had a simple story, and after about 20 minutes, this DLC is all gameplay. The Octo Expansion fixes my biggest complaint with Pooh and Molina. Before, they were just kinda there. They didn't really do anything to contribute to the plot like Callie and Marie did. But now they're always around, fill the same role as they did. They did a lot to help flesh out their characters, too. I launched Pooh and Molina just felt like two friendly co-workers without too much personality. Now they feel like two best friends that'll do anything for each other. Marina's the nudie, lovable weirdo, while Pooh is a blunt puck. Puck? Aw, oh, puck. While Pooh is a blunt punk. It even goes into their backstories and how they met, and honestly, I really like the two now. Apparently, they met on a place called Mount... Nantai? That is dangerously close to Hentai. Moon Lumina did get some characters to them and small snippets in their announcements when you turn the game on, but nothing like an Octo expansion. I still like the Squid Sisters slightly more, but off the hook, who actually were these successors to them now? I was pleasantly surprised by how much humor was in this expansion as well. Most mission names are pop culture references. There was a lot of humor in the chats between Pearl Marina and Cuttlefish, and the amount of time C Cucumber tells you you failed a mission is borderline sadistic. You know, in a funny way. You took damage, fail. The ball fell off the map? Fail. You decided to exist the wrong way? Fail. If you haven't read the chat logs you'll get throughout the campaign, do it. These conversations are amazing. Or do I make the chat full screen? Alt F4. The same combo also gets you an instant win in Fortnite. You heard it here folks, be sure to use it on your foes in the heat of battle. This DLC has an unhealthy obsession with the number 8 too. You play as Agent 8, who is an Octoling. You can shoot around 8 balls, there was 80 missions to play, it's called Octo Expansion, and if you do everything, you can get about 8 hours of content out of this. 
I was waiting for this to come out on August 8th, which would have been some legendary dedication. We're playing two fools while Nintendo is over here playing Wank Axe matches. But I really have to compliment the soundtrack of this DLC. Splatoon's always had some awesome tunes, but they really went the extra mile with this one. It's a weird mix between chill, panic, and intense high energy tracks, and it was a surprise highlight for me. The gameplay, though, is more single player with Splatoon, but it's got enough different to stand out from the rest of single player. There's just no generally shorter than the ones found in the main story, but there were a lot more of them, and they were a lot more challenging. I was pleasantly surprised by how challenging these missions are. I didn't think they were that hard, except for a few here and there, but I am able to maintain at least a B- in all the ranked modes, so make of that what you will. The mission variety was really enjoyable, though. There's plenty of regular roll missions, but some have you moving around that's a dumb 8-ball, some involve shooting down Togus, and some just have you sculpt the boxes. Okay. The amount of special win conditions was really refreshing compared to just get to the end like in previous campaigns. These missions aren't free, though. Every mission has an entrance fee in the form of CQ points. If you run out of lives, you don't have to restart the mission, but you do have to pay the fee again. This adds a strangely cool death penalty. Aw oh man, I don't want to pay this dumb fee again. My favorite part about these missions is that a lot of them give you a choice between multiple weapons. Different weapons give you different amounts of points if you finish the mission with them. Splatoon 2 had you using different weapons throughout the campaign, but you weren't able to pick which one until you finish it once. Octo Expansion is probably the best way to go about this. You can pick between 1-3 to three weapons and have the levels be designed around those. If you don't like one particular weapon, you don't usually have to use it. Some missions even have you use special weapons for the whole stage. Turns out the rolling around in a ball or flying around with an inkjet is super fun when you don't have a time limit. Except for when you do have a time limit. Oh, we ran out of time? Test failed! Some missions even have you equipped with no weapon at all. Yeah, I'm looking at you, move it, move it station. 200 CQ fee? Yeah, whatever, who cares. 40 or so tries later, I just lost 8,700 CQ points. Welcome to the Salty Splatoon, how tough are you? How tough am I? I went through this mission and only cried for 20 minutes. Sea Cucumber can go suck a big fat hairy, go from mission to mission through a subway world map, and this is where the Octo Expansion really shines. When you get to a mission indicated with a square, you'll unlock a new line, opening up new paths to go through. As you do more missions, more lines open up, giving you more pathways to get to the main objective. Using this, most missions are optional. You can get the full fangs in any order you want, and you can make your own pathway to each one. Assuming you can actually finish each mission, it really reminds me of Mario games. If you know how to, you can make your own path to the end of the game and skip huge chunks of what you originally intended to do. When you get to one of the things, you just kind of get it. There's no boss or anything, it's just waiting for you, which feels really weird. I get that the challenge is getting to it to begin with, but I kind of expected to fight something for it. Bosses in Octo Expansion are optional too. There is a new boss near the end, but you could otherwise realistically not run into any bosses in Octo Expansion. I only found one boss while playing for the game, and it was just one of the bosses from the base game, except you fight it with the Inkjet. There's apparently a new super boss if you finish every mission, but I only needed to do about half the total missions to get to the full Thangs and get to the last stretch of the game. I love how lenient this game is when getting to the Thangs. This is going to make replaying this expansion a lot more fun. Instead of just taking the main path, just try and find how many different ways you can get all full Thangs. The final mission of the game is really annoying, though. But before I get into that, the final stretch of the game leading up to it is really good. Like, it was honestly my favorite part of Octo Expansion. Once you gather the full things, it's time to go to the Promised Land. Wait, are the full things the ports through a blender? What the hell? These dumbasses actually step into the blender, and you can guess what happens next. Psych. Agent 3 pulls a Deus Ex Machina, saves Aiden Cuttlefish, and is then knocked unconscious. They find the blueprints of blueprints? They find the blueprints of the facility on 3's transport thing, and a portal esque safe sequence happens. How did I not mention all the portal vibes I got from this yet? You go through missions, which are referred to as tests. You trap some underground facility, the main villain ends up being a sentient AI. This is portal without the puzzles and dark humor. I feel awful about that surprise. Tell you what, let's give your parents a call right now. Parents who are trying to reach do not love you. Please hang up. Oh, that's sad. But impressive. Maybe they worked at the phone company. Anyway, I love the stealth section you play through in the foods level. It makes you submerge into your ink and slowly move around so that enemies don't spot you. It's a really cool use of the mechanic. The port later on when we have to dodge lasers is a close second favorite level in the game. 
It feels like I'm escaping from a bank heist or something. Whenever you die in this point, you just restart at the last checkpoint with no real penalty since you don't need to pay entrance fees anymore. It seems like you actually die though, because the other characters yell out your name like it's Metal Gear. Eight? Eight? Eight! After all this is over, you end up fighting a mind control Agent 3. Okay, this is amazing. She even attacks you with specials and messed up Splatoon 1 music plays in the background. When you defeat her, it shows you splatting her like the kill feed in multiplayer. That is an awesome touch. This fight alone was worth playing the DLC for. At least for me. Afterwards, you make it to the surface and everyone gets to go home. <laughs> no. That telephone AI thing is called Toru, and he's back to... Exterminate all life on the planet. Toru was supposed to pass the knowledge of the human race onwards after their extinction. But Toru is a racist asshole and just decided to kill all life and start fresh. He took all the test subjects and chopped them all off the blender to create a sludge from which the ultimate life form will emerge from. Am I playing Splatoon right now? This is something I would expect from Xenoblade X, not a game where you fight over what color to paint the floor. Marina comes up with a plan to use the hyperbomb she's conveniently been working on to cover up the statue of the ink. Since the death ray is powered by sunlight, this will stop it from charging. However, the bombs have to be detonated manually. So, it's your job to detonate the hyperbombs before the death wave finishes charging. Sounds simple, right? God, I wish. My issue with this section is that it really comes down to memorization more than anything, and why is life will change playing right now? Alright, look. You can't tell me it doesn't fit. Anyway, this mention is basically just memorizing when the bombs are and figuring out the most efficient way to detonate them. You are not going to finish this first try. They just barely give you enough time to detonate all of them. When I finally beat it, I had one second left on the clock. True, you do get quicker with practice, but I'd argue that makes this worse. When you detonate them quickly, it just makes you wait around more because the bombs come in waves. Over time, Marina releases more of them. When you finish a set early, you have to wait for the next set to arrive. So if you're speedy about this, there's just a bunch of waiting around for no reason. I failed this mission a lot. It took me like 9 or 10 tries, and by the end, I just wanted to get it over with. I like the idea behind this final mission, but the way it was implemented just feels sloppy and not very fun. It's a shame too, because Splatoon has had some amazing final bosses in the past. This doesn't really count as a boss, but this is the weakest finale in the entire series by far. At least gameplay-wise. Even if you count Agent 3 as the final boss of the Octo expansion, that wasn't that great either. Don't get me wrong, it's an awesome fight from the idea alone. But if it wasn't a major character you were fighting, it wouldn't really be anything exciting. But if you fail the mission, a short cutscene plays showing Inkopolis getting destroyed. Oh my god, that's incredible. And weirdly dark. After that's finally over, Pearl is able to kill away all the not fully charged laser out of existence in a Dragon Ball-esque power struggle. The Death Ray gets destroyed, they all go home. The end. Roll credits. Nintendo, you magnificent bastards. That's the squid dabbing guy from the Switch presentation. After you finish Octo Expansion, you can not only play as an Octoling in multiplayer, and why would she go back to Inklings? She's too pure for this world. But you also get a new weapon, and when you finish all the missions in the same line, you get a new piece of gear as well. I really like how that Octolings get separate HUD icons from Inklings. It's a nice touch, and it helps differentiate players. And since I'm here, my opinion on Splatoon 2 overall has changed a lot. When it first came out, I did like it more than the first game, but it was something I didn't think I'd go back to very often. Then one day, something just clicked and I couldn't stop playing. I actually started playing the other modes more, got pretty decent at ranked matches, and most of all, I learned how to use gyro controls. Oh my god, looking back at all the footage, how the hell did I manage to use stick controls? Like, they're fine, but oh my god. As the guy who thought they were weird ever since the first game came out, don't be like me. Yes, the gyro aiming is weird at first, but if you stick to it and get used to them, they give you mouse levels of accuracy. I still appreciate the fact that you can turn them off, but now that I'm used to gyro aiming, I can't go back. They feel too good. When it comes to the other modes, Samurai is a really nice distraction from the regular multiplayer, and you get insane amounts of cash from the higher ranks. When it comes to the ranked modes, I really like all of them now. Except for Clan Blitz, but I'll get into that. Splat Zones is still engaging as I always thought it was, and it's still my favorite mode in the game. Tower Control is still fun too, but once I got better at killing other players, I found myself liking it more than I did before. Rainmaker though, this mode's awesome. It just feels so exhilarating taking the Rainmaker from the enemy team and slamming it down on the enemy base. It feels kind of intimidating at first, but once you get used to it, it's super fun. Even though I suck at it. Now for the new ranked mode, Clan Blitz. Clan Blitz kinda sucks. The objective of this mode is to gather clans to form a clam football thing. Then you take it to the enemy goal and use it to destroy the barrier around their goal. 
In concept, this sounds like a nice change of pace. The issue is the lack of voice chat. This mode is just too hard to get the hang of and figure out how everything works. And the other modes, you know what's going on within a round or two. The objective is simple enough that voice chat is strangely not required, but in Clan Blitz, voice chat seems almost necessary. It requires coordination to bombard the goal of Clan, so you can't really do that without proper communication with your teammates. The lack of voice chat has never been an issue for Splatoon. It's just this one dumb mode. But despite almost requiring voice chat, players seem to know what they're doing once they get to B- rank. I'm over-exaggerating the issues with it, though. It's kind of fun, but I'd rather just play any other mode. And strangely, my opinion on Tour 4 has changed, too. Compared to the ranked modes, Tour 4 is really boring. You do the same thing all the time. And while Tour 4 is still a solid mode, I'd rather just play ranked or Salmon Run most of the time. It's not so much that I don't like it, I just kind of get bored with it after a while. But all these modes keep getting better with new weapons and maps. All of which is free. There's even a higher X rank as well, but most people aren't good enough for X rank, so I doubt most of you care about that. No offense to you lovely people, I'm not good enough for it either. But to clarify, all the new multiplayer content is free. Anything that isn't the Octo Expansion, you still have access to right now if you've still got the game. So be curious what multiplayer has to offer now, just boot the game back up and start playing again. As for issues I originally had with the game, a lot of it has been fixed. For one, you can finally change gear in between matches. This was the biggest flaw ever since the first game, and I'm so glad it's finally been addressed. As for Pearl and Marine as the new announcers, I've already been over this. They were the successors of Kali and Marie now, and they have proper story significance thanks to the Octo expansion. Some of its issues still haven't been fixed, though. The lack of a party system still sucks. Maybe they're waiting for Switches Online to go paid, but who knows at this point. If Rocket League and Fortnite can do it on Switch, I see no reason why Splatoon can't. Salmon Run is still only available at certain times, but the mode is available for longer periods now usually on for about 36 to 48 hours, and off for about 12 hours. It's nice that it's available for longer now, but I also wish it rotated maps every 12 hours or something. Speaking of maps, two maps in rotation is still annoying. I still love the idea of it. Play the game at different times so that you don't play on the same map all the time. You have a 50-50 chance, at least to my knowledge, to play on one of the two maps available at the time. But if you've played Pokemon, a 50-50 RNG chance means nothing. This system is designed so you don't get tired of playing on the same map. The issue is that you get tired of playing on the same map because the random number generator decides to make you play on the same map four times in a row. This is how it should work. Three maps in rotation, which is how many there are in Splatfest, a 1 in 3 chance to start out, then a 50-50 chance in the maps that weren't picked last time. This would make the map rotation a lot less repetitive and overall more fun. I'm not a game designer though, so who knows. You still can't skip the stage announcements either. Okay, I'm probably a weirdo, but I actually like the stage announcements. I like hearing what Pearl and Marina have to say about stuff for some reason. Although, I do agree that you should be able to skip it. Or at least be able to speed it up if this is some disguised loading screen. The voice chat in the mobile app still sucks, but it does work in the background now, so... Progress? I guess? Just use Discord. Hashtag not an ad. But, uh, hey, Discord, I wouldn't be opposed to that. Sell out. Ha! I don't get paid for any of this. It's fun though, so who cares? But I was actually really surprised to hear so many complaints about being disconnected from matches. It seems like this really common issue, but I've only been disconnected like two or three times in the 75 or so hours I've played in multiplayer. From my experience, Splatoon 2 has way better servers than the first game. In Splatoon 1, disconnects almost made the game unplayable for me. But I've had so few issues online in the second game that I'm shocked so many people have this issue. I played with a friend one time and he was disconnecting all the time and even noticeably lagging behind. It was so bizarre. Maybe my internet is just better than I give it credit for, but this game has played really damn well online for me. Don't let those small issues bother you, though. If you're still on the fence about Splatoon 2, it's an amazing game, and it's only gotten better since launch. It may still be 60 bucks, but the multiplayer updates are free, so the price is still justified in my opinion. As for the Octo expansion, this is honestly some of the best DLC I've ever played. This is easily worth the 20 bucks, especially if you choose to do every mission. It's just as long as the main game, while the finale was a bit lackluster, it's overall the best single-player campaign Splatoon has ever had in my opinion. It can be tough as nails sometimes, but this is the most fun I've ever had in single-player Splatoon. Octo Expansion feels like a Splatoon 2.5, and if they release a second expansion with the same quality as this one, I wouldn't mind that. Hell, this DLC is so good that I ended up bumping Splatoon 2 into my top 20 favorite games. Even when the servers go down, at least I'll still have Octo Expansion. But whether or not you pick up the Octo Expansion, be sure to give Splatoon 2 a second shot if you haven't already. I did, and it's getting pretty close to be my most played Switch game in about 90 hours. 
which isn't a lot in the grand scheme of things, but I almost put more time into this than the game I bought the system for. That speaks for itself. This has been that flame assassin guy, and I'm probably never playing as an inkling ever again. This Octoling is too cute. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you all next mission.